Uh, we have a jam-packed agenda for you today. Uh, so we look forward to a wonderful discussion with uh, the Historic Albina Advisory Board. Give us just, I'm gonna give us just a couple of moments. So appreciate you for your patience. Thank you. For those uh, in the public who are joining us, who might be in the room with us today, we appreciate your presence. Um, I want to briefly just go over, if you have um, desired to make a public comment today, you would need to uh, raise your hand, uh, make sure that you are muting your computer to avoid the background noise. Uh, we want to encourage you, as I've mentioned before, to focus your comments on today's meeting topics. Uh, you will have up to one minute for your comment. Uh, and um, at that time, we will be moving on to the next comment. Uh, though we appreciate your presence, we want you to know this is a meeting that is open to the public. It is not a public meeting. So we thank you for taking the time to join us today. We will only have time um, for a short amount of public comment, uh, but we appreciate your voice. It definitely matters in this process. Uh, there's a phone number that you can call uh, 971-247-1195. Uh, you will dial star nine to write, raise your hand and Miss Natalie will help to walk you through that. Give us just one more minute and we'll begin um, our Historic Albina Advisory Board meeting. Erica? Yes, ma'am. This is Grace. Um, Song Bai is, call, is calling in by phone and will need to be added to the uh, conversation. And I don't know awesome. if you need to be added can, now or not. Can you give me the last four of his telephone number? I will try. I'll go off. I'll move for just a minute and then uh, come, come back on. Yes, ma'am. Thanks. Thank you to all who have joined us this afternoon for the I-5 Rose Quarter Improvement Project Historic Albina Advisory Board meeting. We were just giving a moment for a number of the uh, additional board members to join us on the call. Uh, if you give us just a moment, we'll begin uh, with you shortly. Um, that's uh, Erica, that's 5969. Perfect. Thank you, Ms. Grace. Thank you.
We have a jam-packed meeting for you all today. Uh, because of that, I'd love for us uh, to get going. I thank you to all of you who um, were able to join us right on time. I understand in this uh, COVID kind of Zoom meeting environment, often people are moving from one space to the next. Uh, and so some of our additional historic Albina advisory uh, members will be joining us shortly, but I'd like to get started. Uh, next slide, please, Miss Natalie. I want to uh, recap for you today. We have a um, very, very exciting meeting with some committee updates. Uh, we also have an update from the independent cover assessment team. Um, I'm also pleased to have with you, um, uh, with us today, uh, Grace Kronikin and some of the panel members from the um, uh, peer review of the environmental assessment to give us some updates and some insight into uh, their findings. Uh, also pleased to have with us uh, Vice Chair Orlando Simpson. Uh, then we'll have a discussion uh, in regards to um, a little bit of um, the uh, baseline explained for you. So we have a, a baseline that we're all working from in regards to um, the EA. Uh, and then we'll have a conversation with Miss Jessica in regards to the project brand identity. Uh, so I'm excited about that as well. Uh, next slide, please, Miss Natalie. You all are our pros at this. You understand that we want to hear from you. Your voice matters, speak your truth. Make sure you're listening for understanding. Uh, oftentimes we'll have some uh, conflict, so expect to have a little discomfort, deal with the issues and not the people. Uh, we want you to remain ex respectfully engaged. So those on the Historic Albina Advisory Board and who have speaking parts, please keep your camera on when possible. And uh, we did not get to this point overnight, so we cannot solve everything today in this meeting. We expect and accept non-closure today. Uh, next slide. I'm going to do just a bit of a shift uh, because I know we have some time constraints uh, with vice chair. And so I would love to uh, jump quickly uh, to uh, our uh, program director, Ms. Megan Channel, uh, who will uh, give some introductions here. Sure. Um, and good afternoon, uh, Historic Albina Advisory Board. Um, before I jump into my project updates, uh, I do want to turn it over to um, our OTC Vice Chair, Orlando Simpson, um, who is joining us for uh, the beginning of our meeting this morning, um, just uh, to give some remarks. Um, so Vice Chair Simpson, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Megan. Um, and first of all, thank you, everybody, for um, committing your time to this interesting process um, that you are going through, which I mean, interesting to the extent that, you know, there's a lot of uh, wounds here as it pertains to what has happened to this community historically and ongoingly. Um, but I do believe that there is a very important group of leaders and individuals in all different disciplines that are working collectively to ensure that what happens out of, as a result of this project actually can foster a model for how you actually build community going forward and how that really impacts and restores some of the historical injustices and wrongs that impacted a particular group. Uh, Portland is not the only place where highways have scarred the fabric of a community. Um, it's happened all over um, the, the entire country. I mean, it happens all over the world, if you talk about it in today's standards. Um, but I do believe that, you know, things are starting to change little by little. And as we know, or I, I would say our, um, our ops manager, and my facility operation always says, um, you know, we don't eat the elephant all at once. It's just one bite at a time. And so um, I think if we keep that in the back of our minds, knowing that change comes with baby steps, and we little, every little single matter, matters, uh, we won't have to worry about the uh, home runs. And so um, to just be adamant and um, optimistic about where we're going and trust the process. And I think that, that kind of applies to, to most things in life. But um, I just wanted to kind of say a couple of things as it pertains to where things are at today. <clears throat> um, at our last meeting, um, we had an update on the work of the independent highway cover. Um, and there's a lot of community feedback during that first round of workshops. And um, for the ICA team, 
really the role that they've been brought on to really assist the agency with was, you know, generating up to three feasible engineering and, arch and architectural options. In one of our previous ESC meetings, I raised this question to the group because there's, we can come up with all kinds of pretty pictures and designs, but the real question is what can we do within the boundary that we actually have? And I think sometimes um, when people aren't fully privy to who controls what jurisdiction, who owns what, who does that? I mean, we have a city where ODOT owns a highway we have a city that owns the streets, and then we have a county that owns a bridge all within like one mile radius. So think about when you talk about transportation, how complicated that can get when you have three different public agencies with three different policy structures working together to achieve something. And I think um, trying to set those boundaries and getting people to understand what swimming lanes everybody's functioning in, it makes it easier to try to think through what you can and can't do um, as you're working through community engagement processes. So I would just highly encourage folks um, that, you know, we obviously want to focus on the community and the economic needs for this particular area. But the one thing we have to be cognizant on is keeping in mind that we do have boundaries. There's a specific footprint that has been defined under our environmental assessment approval that was issued through the federal government. And we must work within those boundaries. Um, ODOT doesn't do housing, ODOT doesn't do schools, ODOT doesn't do um, a lot of the ancillary things, uh, small business incubation. I guess you can say they have a mentor protege program through contracting um, and things of that nature. And they administer the disadvantaged business enterprise program through the federal government. Um, but outside of that, there's not a lot of things that ODOT can do. I think ODOT can be a great convener and partner with a lot of other public agencies that oversee a lot of other things pertaining to urban planning housing and, and, and city street infrastructures and utility systems and things of that nature that are necessary to build a community. But there's only one particular role that ODOT plays in this whole conversation. Um, and I'm just humbled to be a part of ODOT taking a leadership role, being vulnerable, being honest about what it has done historically and what it plans to do to try to um, create a different paradigm on how it invests in communities. And I think that says a lot about an agency that's gone through a lot over the past couple of years. And I know it firsthand because I've been a part of it. I've spent my whole 30s on ODOT, which I don't know if that's going to like cause me trauma and harm as I get older or not, but I'm hoping it doesn't. I'm hoping things like these can actually showcase as to why we actually become public servants and why we try to change systems in order to make them better for our future generations. So I just want to encourage, you know, everybody here to understand that at the, at the, at the commission level for ODOT, we are definitely pushing. Uh, it's a 5,000 person agency. So as, he, as much as we want wanted to change overnight, that's not realistic and that's not practical. It's gonna take time. And uh, for folks to just be patient with that time and be patient that you know, folks that are leading these efforts within the urban mobility office and with region, within region one, they are starting to come along with this new direction and this new ethos and this new culture that is being instilled through the agency by our leader, Chris Strickler. Um, who I was a very big fan of going through the hiring process uh, after Matt Garrett retired from ODOT after 10 years, which he was the longest standing director in the United States at that, at that time. Um, and I think ever for that, for that, for that matter, as far as I know to date. But I just wanted, I wanted to say those things so you guys can actually know from me, honest and vulnerable and just transparent that, you know, this is, this is how I feel, this is how I think about the process. Um, today's presentation will give us, you know, a lot stronger understanding of that baseline footprint, which I think is the main emphasis that I want folks to kind of keep in mind. Um, and understanding that, that baseline will help this group evaluate the feasibility of that cover design so that we can start working towards reconnecting this community and thinking about bigger opportunities like the group that's working on and more of an economic development strategy uh, referred to as Albina Vision Trust as it pertains to urban planning efforts. And so whatever role the department can play in that effort to try to help streamline and help assist foster through a bigger economic development strategy, such as one that is really large and aspirational like Alpine Vision Trust, I think we're all fans and, and supportive of. Um, so um, for with that, um, I just want to, uh, again, thank you all for, uh, for your time, for your energy, for your sacrifice and your public commitment to this effort. Um, we want to make sure that we work obviously within those boundaries, but 
to me personally, as everything has happened, I don't think it's necessary that we try to delay a project to force it to go through another environmental rigorous review when we have an opportunity right in front of us. And somebody can go verify this. But as the team has been designated right now within the, con within the construction partnership on this project, there is an estimated $100 million that is going to go back into the hands of a black owned construction firm, period. Now, why is that important? It's because it is one of the largest, if not the largest contract ever issued to a black owned civil engineering firm, not on the West Coast, but in our, in our entire country. That is transformational. And when you think about the amount of money that goes back into the community in the form of jobs and opportunities and economic development and people being able to buy homes and build wealth and change the paradigm in which we're actually even talking about homes being taken from people. This is the bigger conversation we have to focus on. And, um, and, I'm, and I'm really adamant that we're going down this path. I think we're gonna do it the right way. I'm optimistic we're gonna do it the right way. We can't do it the right way without stakeholders such as yourselves and the other folks that have been involved in this entire process. Uh, but Personally, delaying a process like this with that kind of opportunity on the table, which is transformational, uh, wouldn't be the most logical thing for us to do, especially in a moment when everybody seems to believe Black Lives Matter. I'm a big advocate for Black economic prosperity matters uh, because economic prosperity leads to independence. And so the only way we can actually restore an independent and rebuild Black community um, you have to be able to provide opportunities to um, economic independence. And so um, I believe that the construction opportunity right here would be a great catalyst to that. And I encourage you guys all to continue to challenge the agency, push the agency, demand the agency do things outside the box and different, but to always keep in mind that there's boundaries in which you work through outcomes to try to get to positive solutions. And so in this case, we unfortunately have a boundary unless people believe it doesn't make sense to put $100 million into the black community as fast as possible. If people don't believe that, then sure, I understand. I don't believe that because I think our community needs it the most since it's been here the longest in this country, yet it still is in last place economically on the, on the, on the totem pole. So again, I'm sorry for the vomit session and the rant <laughs> and the soapbox, but, um, I appreciate everybody's time commitment to this again, and um, I'm available if anybody wants to reach out and talk in any more depth about what my thoughts and ideas are as the chair of the ESC or as a commissioner of, 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 of the OTC as it relates to this project going forward. So, Megan, thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, I got, yeah, and adding on to that, um, I really appreciate those comments. And you know, we as an agency under your leadership um, remain committed to centering the voices of the Black community as we move this project forward in partnership specifically um, with each of you as our historic Albina Advisory Board members. So thank you for um, thank you for uh, trusting us to to show up to this space, um, and thank you for uh, holding us accountable as we partner together moving forward. Um, Erica, do you and, want me to, oh, please go ahead. I just, I just wanted to apologize to the group as well, because I'm going to be leaving. And that's why I said, feel free to reach out to me anytime. Um, I have a, a group of young kids that I work with at the Salvation Army. I'm trying to work on something over there as well. Uh, but thank you for allowing, allowing me the, the, the time to share my thoughts and comments. And um, I'll turn it back over to you guys. Thanks. Indeed. Thank you so much, Vice Chair Simpson. Uh, we just appreciate uh, you being here with us tonight. And we understand your commitment. You're all over the community. So uh, we, we respect that. Uh, have a good evening with your kids. <laughs> Um, I, I just would love to, Megan, thank you so much. Um, I realize we're a little bit off of our agenda, but I appreciate your patience and your flexibility. I'm going to get to everything. We're going to get to the public comment. Um, and, and so um, quickly, uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, Megan, if you would chime in and give us an update on the, the um, community, uh, the COAC, forgive me, I, I just lost <laughs> in my memory. I've got you. Oversight <laughs> Advisory Committee. Yes. Thank Indeed. you so much, Megan. 
Indeed. So um, on behalf of John L. Bell, uh, who is the facilitator of the Community Oversight Advisory Committee, um, just want to make sure that you as the have are updated on what that group is doing. Um, so at their meeting last month, there was a strong focus on the diversity plan um, that is being prepared by our um, CMGC partners um, uh, in coordination with Raymore Construction. Uh, and so the focus um, for their last meeting was really on uh, an initial section of the diversity plan um, and the, um, the DBE component. Um, and we'll be continuing to work with the uh, COAC members uh, over the coming months uh, as we uh, work in tandem in partnership with uh, our CMGC team in finalizing that diversity plan. Um, and we'll be getting to uh, future topics around subcontracting um, and workforce opportunities in those coming meetings. So uh, I'd say it's a, it's a start uh, of the process. Uh, we're very early in the development of the diversity plan. Uh, and so more is to come. And uh, as, as COAC comments continue uh, to uh, be developed in coordination with CMGC, we'll make sure that the HAB is apprised uh, of the details of that diversity plan moving forward. Um, so with that, uh, I will pause on the COAC update. I appreciate that. And just because uh, he's in the meeting with us, uh, Janelle, if you had any uh, comment or just wanted to address the group, I wanted to make sure to acknowledge you this evening. Thank you, Erica, and uh, good afternoon or evening, Hab. Uh, I think uh, that covers it uh, in terms of what Megan uh, uh, updated. So that covers it. Great, thank you so much. I'd like to move quickly. Uh, Dr. Holt, if you would give us an update on the Executive Steering Committee. Absolutely. If we go to that slide, that'd be great. But uh, you just heard from uh, Alando Simpson, who is the chair of the Executive Steering Committee, and he's the vice chair of the Oregon Transportation Commission. And he gave a very high level overview of what we covered in our last uh, meeting with the Executive Steering Committee. You can see it on your screen. Um, project updates were the I-5 mainline design overview and we talked extensively around the air quality recap. And then there was a brief moment for the Portland Public Schools to give an update and they will be on the agenda for the upcoming Executive Steering Committee to talk about Tubman. So it would be great if members of the HAB would like to listen in. Um, we're asking that Portland Public Schools kind of give us the strategy with what they're um, uh, planning related to that space. There are several executive steering committee members who have asked and inquired in regard to that. And then ICA gave us uh, the recap around uh, work session number one, as they did with you, and then the preview for work session number two. I want to um, uh, uh, spend a few moments just to talk about though, uh, the intent, and you kind of heard the heartbeat of um, Chair Simpson. Part of the intent of the work for the Executive Steering Committee is to coordinate uh, efforts with the Historic Albina Advisory Board. We think it would be extremely valuable to spend some time together uh, and think through uh, the work around the covers and to have conversation and dialogue and come to a place of, of leveraged agreement around um, kind of the feedback and determinations. As you know, the recommendation from the HAB comes to the Executive Steering Committee, and then the Executive Steering Committee makes a recommendation to the uh, OTC. Um, so be expecting some, some communication in regard to coordinating, um, a time to meet so that we can think about how to process together um, what we're working on as a collective. The hope and the goal is to make this a collective strategy and a partnership. So that's my update for the ESC. Thank you so much, Dr. Holt. Uh, again, I understand that this is a little uh, off schedule, but Natalie, if you could move back to public comment, I'd love to give the opportunity for those uh, from the community who have joined us this evening uh, to uh, let their voices be heard tonight. So Miss Natalie, I'll turn it to you. Thank you, Erica. Um, I um, am just sharing this screen right now um, with information on how to dial in and make a public comment. This information is also below the YouTube video if you're joining us through the live stream. I'll go ahead and stop sharing right now and invite Mira to share her uh, on-screen timer. 
um, for the public comment. Um, and I'm looking for any raised hands. Um, I'll, uh, I do see one hand raised right now. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself and provide your public comment just as soon as we get the, um, the timer up on the screen. Are we, are we able to get that? One moment, please. You're trying to connect with people, trying to get the most response for people. So one of the key things to remember when you're beginning to write is that you have to understand Okay, that should be showing. Um, and I'll be, um, hopefully everybody can see the on-screen on timer. Um, phone number ending in 8577. Uh, please make your comment. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Okay, fantastic. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Aaron Brown. I'm a plaintiff on that lawsuit you all probably read about yesterday. Uh, we filed a complaint because we caught ODOT lying to the public about the air pollution this expansion will bring to the backyard of Tubman Middle School and the Albina neighborhood. And in a few minutes here, they're going to repeat these slights of hand to you. Two years ago, ODOT deliberately put their fingers on the scale to manipulate the freeway expansion traffic data. That's the only way ODOT could find peer review consultants who could make the claim this would be the first freeway expansion in history to lower nearby air pollution. Any claims that this expansion will be positive for air pollution is based on this faulty data. It's not the peer review viewer's fault, it's ODOT's. You should ask the peer review consultants if they've reviewed ODOT's traffic data. We have proof ODOT cooked the books, but it's a little too complicated for one minute testimony. But every single one of you on this committee is empowered to ask ODOT's facilitators to let no more freeways speak at the next meeting for longer than one minute. Even just 15 minutes. Surely ODOT trying to empower you would let you invite me to speak for 15 minutes. What does ODOT have to hide? If ODOT says no, you can email me directly at info at no more freeways pdx.com. And in closing, I'll encourage you to review the written testimony submitted by Joe Courtright ahead of this meeting, which shows maps of exactly what ODOT is proposing Thank you. in the backyard of Tubman. Um, and I'll we encourage need to move on. The rally. So I will um, thank you for your comment. Um, I'm looking for any other, um, any other comments and I'm not seeing any other raised hands. A reminder at the bottom of your um, YouTube live stream, you can see the, the information for how to dial in. Um, and I'll just give it another moment and then uh, we can move on. And seeing none. Um... Thank you, Miss Natalie. Erin, thank you so much for your, your uh, public comment and um, you're always very thoughtful. Uh, I wanna remind all of us in the virtual space, this is a meeting that is open to the public. It is not a public meeting. Uh, and so we want to give some space for those who have an opportunity or would like to share, um, but there are several, several ways for you to communicate your thoughts uh, and for you to provide comments to um, this historic Albina Advisory Board for review. Um, if you would look on the i5rosequarter.org website, uh, there is a uh, email there. There's also a phone number um, that you can make sure uh, that your voice is heard and that the uh, board has an opportunity to hear your comment. All right, Natalie, if you would share the slides as I would like to move back um, and um, introduce Ms. Gina Woolley and the independent cover assessment team. Uh, and they have uh, some updates for you all as well. Well, basically, thank you, Erica. And um, good evening um, to all of the HAB members. Um, I am, I'm here, um, I've been graciously allotted at some time on this very, very busy agenda, which um, our team is very is grateful for. But I'm here really to solicit your help. Could you could we go to the next slide to solicit your your uh, assistance in um, basically getting more Black community uh, participation in our next online open house? So. Each work session that we do um, involves um, basically, and we this the upcoming work session next week is the second work session, and each work session involves two community workshops. And it involves a two-week online open house, a meeting with you and with your body, which is really a mini workshop and a mini workshop with ESC. Can we go to the next slide? So um, 
one of the things you may recall, you've seen this report out a couple of week, a couple of meetings back about workshop one. We had um, we reached out to actually this uh, 100, um, 100 community organizations was more like 150. We just completed all of the detailed um, outreach and of the individuals. And uh, so we actually reached out to over 150 churches, neighborhood businesses and individuals. We ended up with 48 participants. And of those participants, 41 of those participants were black. So we had a strong black his, um, historic albina community voice in the in the workshops uh, so that we could understand what the community is most concerned about seeing happen on the covers and that's part of our charge can we go to the next one this is just a breakout of how that group broke down uh, business owners community members from various segments of the community and uh, then um, um, basically including the affordable folks from the affordable housing uh, environment. And then we had three uh, at large organizations. Then in contrast to that, if we'll go to the next slide, um, in our online workshop, we actually, uh, um, online open house, we actually had 203 individuals fill out the survey of those individuals, seven of them were black. Um, the online open house is available to everyone during that two week period. Anyone can go to albina covers, uh, albinahighwaycovers.com and essentially fill out the survey. This next survey, particularly since um, there's been a lot of discussion already in this meeting about the base case and about the ICA uh, cover um, scenarios, we will, be uh, presenting those scenarios and allowing you to comment on them. So this is a very important um, um, second work session and a very important one for us to hear from more of the black community about what's important to them. So what I wanted to do is just um, encourage um, each of you on the HAB to reach out to your networks um, the ODOT is actually uh, doing a, a pretty robust um, PI campaign um, relate around the work sessions and in, uh, getting the word out about the work sessions. I believe they have a toolkit for organizations uh, that want to, um, you know, do out, I mean, to put out the word within their organizations and their networks. So. Uh, I, I would encourage each of you as a participant and a volunteer in this process to really help us get the word out in the black community and get more participation from uh, black community members in the online open house. We, we only have so much room in a COVID environment. Um, our workshops are very um, intense. They're three hours long. We've got to cover a lot of ground. So we can't facilitate 200 people in a workshop. So we have a good cross representation of community representation in those workshops. And the way for the rest of the community to participate in our process is to go to the online open house, which will be open next Friday, uh, not this Friday, but the next Friday on the 16th of April, and it will run through the May 3rd. And so I'm just, you know, encouraging all of you and asking all of you to help us get the word out. So that's that's my update. And um, I thank um, the team for uh, giving us a few minutes on this very busy agenda to try to to um, encourage greater participation in our process. Thank you so much, Miss Gina. It is very important. So I want to uh, echo uh, Miss Gina's sentiments. Uh, we would love to uh, have you participate. Um, I do see um, a very quick question, uh, Miss Leslie Goodall. Um, yes, uh, Miss Gina. Did uh, is there a link or some verbiage that you could? or that has been sent. And I have to admit, you know, I get a lot of emails, so it could be buried somewhere in my email that we could use to post on social media that we could put in emails out to people, uh, a flyer, anything of that nature so that um, we can, can get this information out because uh, 
Uh, I, I understand the, the concern. We had similar issues when we did our housing uh, strategy forums. We got people to come, but most of the folks that responded online were not uh, black or brown. So uh, I'd like to be able to uh, pump this up. So if there's something that you can send us so that we can spread it, spread the news, it would be most helpful to me. Um, thank you so much for your uh, uh, comments, Leslie. And yes, we will get you something. I, you know, I'll work with um, Erica. I, there is a whole package. I just don't know what the timing uh, of when that's going out or, and or whether that's gone out yet. And so um, I, we will check on it and I will get you something personally um, before the week's out, it, um, you know, short of that. So um, be looking for something from ODOT or from myself before the week. Indeed. I, I want to just echo that. Yes, Leslie, um, I um, did hear from um, um, our strategic communications lead, Ms. April Delion Galloway. Um, there is a notification. There is a toolkit with some sample text for social media. And I will make sure to forward that out to um, all of the historic Albina advisory board members again, uh, so that we can uh, get hopefully some increased participation from our um, black and brown community members. So thank you for that. Thank you, Ms. Gina. Yes, thank you. Ms. Natalie, thank you. Yes, I would love to, you can go on to the next slide. This is a packed meeting as always. Um, you are going to hear from um, uh, Grace Kronikin and her team in regards to uh, the peer review uh, regarding air quality and some of the questions. Uh, we wanted to be responsive to a number of your concerns in regards to air quality. So we wanted to bring in those experts to be able to help answer those questions. Also, our um, architecture and engineering team has prepared for you all um, a outline of the, the explanation of the baseline. So again, to be responsive to your questions um, as we're meeting in one-on-ones, what really is included? What are those things that we needed to be um, comparing against? That team is gonna make a presentation to you today as well. Uh, so moving forward, uh, Ms. Megan, if you would uh, do the honor of introducing our peer review panel. Absolutely. Um, and so, you know, as, as Erica mentioned, this portion of the project update really is in direct response to a number of questions that I know you as our HAB members have had around the project's um, air quality and, and climate change analyses. Um, so uh, I'm going to do a quick overview and then I will turn it over to Grace Krennikin, who was the facilitator of our environmental peer review. Um, she's joined with her esteemed panel of experts uh, to provide more information about that process. Um, so we can go to the next slide and the next one. All right. Um, so during the environmental review phase, uh, in addition to the stakeholder outreach that we did, we also had formal coordination under the NEPA or National Environmental Policy Act process uh, with different cooperating and participating agencies. Um, so these are noted specifically on the screen here. And each of these agencies had an opportunity to um, shape our agency coordination plan, um, as well as to provide feedback on the methodology. So how we were doing the technical, technical analyses, the data, reviewing the technical reports, uh, and also provide advanced input on the environmental assessment process. Uh, next slide, just as background, um, this timeline uh, here summarizes the key milestones in the environmental review phase. So, how did we get to where we are today? Uh, and that includes the environmental review process uh, or the peer review process rather. And the environmental review phase kicked off um, just for background in 2017. And then the environmental assessment was published for a 45 day public comment period in February of 2019. And then in response to stakeholder concerns, um, primarily around air quality, greenhouse gas, noise, um, the Oregon Transportation Commission directed us as the agency to conduct uh, an environmental peer review associated with the project's environmental assessment uh, and, the, and these uh, specific topic areas that I just mentioned. And um, through, that, through that process, the peer review informed our publication of the finding of no significant impact and the revised environmental assessment, which, were pub which was published in November of 2020. Um, and this is the document that completes the environmental review process. So next slide. 
Um, the environmental assessment uh, did evaluate a range of technical topics. Uh, so I've listed these here on the slide. Um, you can see uh, the range from you know, transportation, health, uh, environmental, um, social, built environment. Um, and so I wanted to just highlight here that in addition to uh, the key points around air quality, noise and climate change, the assessment also looked at these other um, potential impacts um, in these topic areas. And um, I just want to note um, that using the really a scientific approach uh, guided by federal and state standards, um, the environmental assessment found that the air quality and greenhouse gas emissions uh, are slightly improved with the project, uh, meaning the air will be better with the project built uh, and that noise would be mitigated by the construction uh, of new sound walls, uh, specifically with a sound wall proposed at Harriet Tubman Middle School. And um, these analyses, uh, you know, air quality, climate change, uh, and noise were, were based on the traffic modeling completed for the project. Uh, and I just want to note that the traffic modeling for this project was based on regional data uh, provided uh, through um, Metro's regional travel demand model and the city of Portland's uh, central city model. And these traffic models uh, project the future traffic conditions based on planned and approved land use in our region, um, as well as other transportation projects in our region. And so we, we use this regionally approved data um, following the same traffic analysis um, that's done for other transportation projects within our region uh, to conduct the analysis for the Rose Quarter project. So um, just wanted to make sure that um, you knew it was feeding into the air quality noise and greenhouse gas evaluation. So with that, uh, we hired Grace uh, and, and her panel uh, to develop and lead the environmental review process, um, specifically focused on, um, again, the air quality, noise, and greenhouse gas findings. And under Grace's leadership, uh, we really turned to the expertise of the peer review panel of our national experts to review the findings and provide recommendations. And so with that, uh, I will now turn it over to Grace uh, to detail that work. So Grace, over to you. Thank you very much, Megan. Uh, there is a slide that um, um, has the panel members on it um, that I believe was number one, but I'll address this. This is, this is really the punchline to the uh, whole analysis that was done. And that's that air quality and greenhouse gas emissions uh, improve uh, slightly. And really uh, the greenhouse gas emissions are just a determinant of the air quality as best we could tell. Um, so they were done separately and that um, the noise will increase in the area um, and that with or without the project, but the two noise walls that are, uh, that the assessment said should be done, um, really should be done. We thought that was good. There were a few other uh, uh, improvements that we requested as well. Next slide. Okay. Uh, so these are the panel members, and Dr. Bai, Song Bai is um, on the call today. He's had to phone in um, as opposed to using video. Deborah Ju is on the panel as well. Song is our <clears throat> air quality expert, and uh, Deborah is our noise expert today, but also on the panel from the Transportation Vol Volpe Center in Boston is Andrew Ilbert. He is a noise specialist. And if you could go to the next slide. Um, with us also is Dr. Beverly Scott. She is a transportation uh, and community um, impacts specialist. She has headed up about five transit properties around the country from Boston and Atlanta. Uh, she's worked also in Houston and New York um, and has a great deal of experience. Tim Sexton is a member from uh, Minnesota. And Tim has worked in Washington State. He's quite familiar with the Washington, Oregon situation. And he's our overall environmental expert. He manages this professionally. And he was on the panel that ODOT originally suggested we use. Uh, there were, I think, six or seven panel members ODOT originally suggested. And we kept Tim uh, because of his expertise and some of the incredible work that Minnesota State Department is doing. Um, but the rest are all uh, fresh faces. Uh, Dr. Charles Samoon is also a, a noise expert uh, in New York City, and I'm the convener of the group. Next slide. Um, we had, we invited Portland Public Schools, Multnomah County, Albina Vision Trust, City of Portland and Metro to sit in and observe everything as the project partners. 
um, and the Portland Public Schools and City of Portland Metro took us up on it. The other two, I think, were quite busy with the tasks in front of them on this and other jobs. And COVID had just hit when we started our process, so people were fairly overloaded. I appreciate the time that they did give us. Next slide. Um, the review was, <clears throat> uh, we were convened and asked questions of ODOT. Uh, we were given all of the material. We asked another round of questions. Uh, we had a meeting uh, among ourselves. Other people sat in and watched, but uh, to get uh, additional questions asked, to listen to the questions that have been raised by our partner agencies. And then the panel reached a consensus and I drafted up what they had said and everyone edited it. So the, the project reflects uh, unanimity of content um, from all, all processes. Uh, next slide. Um, we looked at and asked of each of the areas of air quality, noise, and greenhouse gas. We asked about the methodology. Um, what was the process they used? Did they use the proper ones that, that we're aware of? Um, <clears throat> and then we asked, we looked at the analysis that they made, analyzing what the uh, conclusions were in terms of any damage that might be done. And then we looked at the mitigation that was proposed to see if it was appropriate to the analysis and what it produced. Next slide. Um, what we would like to do, I, I, as I've already said, we looked at air quality, noise, and greenhouse gas. And I, I just want to say that the the greenhouse gas it is kind of treated a little a lesser fashion because there aren't NEPA requirements for that, which I'll get to in just a minute. But uh, as we went through these, the committee, um, and, and I think adding Bev to the panel or having Bev on the panel was uh, Dr. Beverly Scott uh, was essential to get other considerations out on the table. And I've asked her to make that presentation today and just give a few of the suggestions we had. Next slide. Um, so from our point of view, uh, we found that the, just, and again, this is the punchline, that ODOT did a proper job on looking at noise and air quality in terms of the methodology that they used, in terms of the final products they recommended, the mitigation that they recommended. Um, there were no greenhouse gas um, uh, mitigations because there's the, the analysis itself was really dependent on the air quality analysis and there aren't guidelines for people to follow yet, but we did think they did a nice job in attempting to get at the greenhouse gas issues. The peer review panel um, focused on a couple of areas uh, that weren't there. We're accustomed in some uh, documents to looking at the construction impacts up front. ODOT is going to be looking at those, but it's in a separate uh, effort that's still to come. So we just want to alert the community, and it's a really uh, incredibly important for you to understand that the impacts of construction in some cases can be um, more dramatic, if you will, than the long-term effects of the project itself. And so it's very important for this panel and for the other panels that are watching what goes on to watch ODOT as it goes through these other steps, because the noise impact of the freeway is kind of a dull roar out there um, if you're out on site. But when they're, during construction, the impacts and the vibration that are there will be extremely uh, obvious to everyone. So we really want one big message to pass on to you is that uh, during construction or, or in preparation for construction, you really need to focus on the, um, the impacts both of air and noise and vibration. Um, I think we've covered that. And then I'm going to have Beverly um, talk about some of the community impacts and what's there. Um, the committee uh, every one of us is uh, long in the tooth in a lot of ways and has been through many projects. And the scar that I-5 left on this community, though I'm the only person that's actually lived in Oregon, and I believe Tim has visited it quite a bit, um, it, it's a very familiar scar. People are accustomed to having Black community ripped apart by state highway projects. And so uh, in terms of addressing this, we spent a lot of time trying to look at what we could do to help provide some form of reparation and, and the lids are really the first thing that steps to try and weave the neighborhood back together and focusing on what can be done to provide in a context of restorative justice, some uh, healing 
to the community we thought was incredibly important. Next slide. Uh, to the issues of air quality, I'm gonna have Song present, but I was going to have him present, but he, uh, this time as was last time, um, is on, a, on the phone. So he asked if I would give the main piece and then he'll be here for uh, Q and A. But one of the things that we need to under, you need to understand is that Portland is in what's called transportation conformity with the state implementation plan. So in, in Oregon, our, our, in Portland area, our air quality is such that it's, it's a good thing that we're in transportation conformity, but therefore ODOT does not need to do project level hotspot conformity analysis. Um, so it, it, it's a good thing um, and ODOT followed what they were supposed to, but there isn't a hotspot analysis to look at. NEPA uh, requires uh, its own analysis. And in this case, ODOT used the mobile source air toxic emissions assessment. Um, and the, the panel was quite impressed with the use of this model. It's the latest and greatest. Um, and so their use was appropriate um, and they followed the model as they were supposed to. It was accurately done. Um, and the results that came out on air quality, uh, the, the conclusion that the air quality will, slight, will be slightly better is in part um, because the mix of autos that are out there in the year of construction when the project is there, the mix of autos is getting better and better and better each year. And some of that um, is what contributes to the overall conclusion that the transportation, that the air quality, excuse me, is gonna be better. I'll leave it at that and allow Sung to provide. I do think there's one other air quality slide. Next slide. So just a, an affirmation here that the analysis conducted was correct and their proper conclusions were provided. They did a good job there. Next slide. Uh, with noise, I'm gonna ask Deborah Ju to uh, present this. Deborah, are you there? Yes. Thanks, Grace. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so as Grace mentioned, um, our peer review of the noise analysis found that the methodology and the analysis itself were correct. And we provided some constructive comments regarding the sharing uh, the information with the community. Um, there are some aspects of it that were just difficult for a layperson to understand. Um, and as Grace mentioned, the construction noise um, analysis hasn't been done, and uh, we made various comments to um, um, for pointer or suggestions for that analysis. Um, and I think those are in the next slide, or there's a third slide. Um, to the third point of our uh, peer review findings, um, we looked at the mitigation proposed for the uh, Harriet Tubman Middle School and the Lilith Albina Park and the surrounding neighborhood. And the proposed malls uh, do meet the necessary performance requirements to be feasible and reasonable. They look uh, basically looking at the how much noise reduction is provided, and um, does it meet the, um, the performance requirements in terms of noise? And uh, we had some suggestions regarding um, possible options to improve the performance of Wall B, uh, possibly if it could be moved a little closer to school. Maybe it would. Um, you know, provides better noise protection. Um, it also would be helpful for air quality. That was something that the panel discussed. And then um, sound one, sound wall one uh, was um, did not come up as a as a viable option. But we were wondering whether ODOT could uh, reconsider their cost um, guidelines, and maybe sound wall one would be uh, would would, uh, would show up better in the analysis. Next slide, please. And then back to construction noise, um, we provide a lot of uh, suggestions um, for abating the construction noise and also some suggestions to the design of the pavement and sound walls. So on this list, um, some of these are not actually construction like number three quiet pavement is something that relates to the overall uh, operational noise from the, from the um, improved uh, wide roadway and um, Number seven uh, relates also to the permanent sound walls. Um, and number four kind of uh, relates both to construction and permanent sound walls. Um, so these were, these were, you know, lots of ideas that have, been, have worked in uh, around the country at other projects that we 
we hope would be um, helpful for ODOT as they go to the next step of doing the construction noise. Thanks, Chris. Um, I want to emphasize on the noise findings before we go on to the committee that um, you really need to make sure ODOT has made the commitment to uh, put in the contracts when they hire these contractors, these uh, added um, requirements, whether it's for noise or for air quality, because if you put that requirement in there, they have to provide equipment that is of caliber in many cases, the filter gets changed or the grinder of some kind gets changed so that it's not as noisy or it doesn't uh, have as many exhaust problems. Um, so it's gotta be, those requirements have to be put in the contracts. And I just wanna say both to ODOT and to the committee, uh, that commitment should be made up front. It's not something you can retrofit later. It's something that is very expensive sometimes, depends on the issue. Um, and sometimes it's not so expensive, but. Um, you, you need to put that up front and the requirements for the, that Deborah talked a little bit about, about uh, the techniques for uh, putting in noise blankets and things like that need to be required. And some of these references we give you are from the, the stuff is laid out in those um, requirements so that you know it, it's good for, it. some of them are meant for citizen involvement, community involvement, so that you know what's being required and you know what to ask for. So thank you, next slide. Um, I'll just note on the greenhouse gas findings that the model that was used, the committee found no problems with that, thought it was good and particularly, and that the infrastructure carbon estimator was used was a good step toward getting uh, information. Um, but ODOT had no standards to follow. They're just ahead of their time in doing this work and, and, and attempting to capture some of this information. Um, and I think the, at the federal level, they'll do a better job of giving uh, a di direction to all of us at some point in time. So we kudos to ODOT for trying, um, but there's nothing to that would continue away through the methodology ass assessment and um, or an analysis and mitigation uh, to sort of hang our hat on. So there's no mitigation to be proposed. Next slide. So there were many other considerations that came up, uh, primarily related to the community uh, and, and an attempt to address, address the inequities that have uh, befallen this community. Um, and I want Dr. Scott, if she would please to walk through some of those and give you a taste for those. There's more in the report. I would encourage you to read. It's a very short report. It's a, I think it's a 10 page report. Um, but Dr. Scott, would you lead us on that please? Okay, uh, Grace, thank you very much. And to everyone, uh, it's been an honor to be able to work on this. I'm going to, um, uh, actually, I can't say a lot more than what uh, Commissioner Simpson said when he uh, uh, made his opening comments. I'm going to talk pretty specifically about things that my eye as a, a, a former general manager looked at if I were looking at the project, just looking at it from a transit perspective. But um, I want to do a, say a couple of things. Number one, I appreciated uh, the transparency, went through a lot of material uh, from prior work that the community had done in terms of saying what they really wanted to see come out of this. And it covered uh, quite a year, a number of years period of time. Um, this is uh, just following up on his comments. This is not about one project. It's really about, uh, it's really a, a major program, a major transformation in terms of where a community is moving forward. So some of the things that I talked about, I'd say things like, you know, it, it would be very good to be able to look at an integrated program of projects in terms of all the different things. This is about much more than just, this is important. ODOT is a, is a major convener, very important, but more of a, a kind of an integrated program of projects. Uh, the other thing I, I've said is uh, uh, this is one of those that's going to really take having the C-suite at the table. You want your technicians there, but for the kinds of commitments and really long-term things that need to take place, uh, this is going to take that go across agencies and organizations. This is really going to take C-suite com uh, commitment. And one of the things that I referenced in my uh, in uh, my comments was around, I'm a big one on institutionalization. Personalities are real fine and dandy, but when it comes to uh, making long-term commitments that are generational for communities, you'll hear people talk about community benefits agreements and things of that nature, which are, are not unique to you in the area, but I would simply say, uh, you know, document, 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 uh, uh, whatever commitments wind up uh, uh, taking place. And in that area, you got the full range, okay? Uh, uh, good jobs, 
uh, business development opportunities, which have already been spoken to, housing affordability, uh, a multitude of different environmental benefits, public arts. There are all kinds of things that, that ultimately can really be wrapped into this project, but then the plethora of projects, if you will, that will make for a total program. Okay, so that that's kind of, you know, that's the kind of the big bear piece. Now, let me tell you specifically, just taking my transit look at it. And I have not had any conversations with TriMet or whatever, but the bottom line is that if I just were looking, okay, uh, you have a major uh, commitment on bus electrification, no different than uh, many communities around the country. And uh, you've got those first buses are coming in and I would be taking a look to prioritize the albi albino community development. Uh, that is an opportunity there. Uh, during construction, as people, as, as folks have said, the devil is always in the details and this will be a fairly uh, extensive project. And so during construction mitigation, I would be paying attention to and have a detailed plan, transfer activity, travel and trip times, walkability, street side amenities in terms of lighting. There have been in some of the discussions, things about a potential for a community shuttle. I'd get deep into that once again, only been at a, I'm not at a surface level in terms of the electrification piece, but on some of that greater, the, that, that's all detail, including things like safe routes to schools, okay, that you would be looking to make sure get baked in as well as issues relative to access and uh, uh, accessibility, particularly for your most vulnerable populations around things like senior centers, uh, major community centers and things of that nature, taking it down to a real granular level in terms of how are people going to negotiate during this period of uh, construction, which goes along with some of the other things that have been noted around uh, construction activity. So I think I'll, I'll just kind of uh, leave it at that. I, once again, I could not say more uh, eloquently uh, than uh, the way the, uh, the uh, commissioner started it is that this is about much more, this is an extremely important catalytic leadership that's here but that this is really a much bigger uh, effort, if you will, than, um, than uh, just ODOT. And oh, what a tremendous opportunity to be able to pull it all together moving forward. So, Thank you, Dr. Scott. That was wonderful. Okay. All right, Erica, back to you for questions or, or Dr. Holder, whoever's in charge. Indeed, I would love if there are members of the Historic Albina uh, Advisory Board who have questions for Grace or for Dr. Scott uh, or for Deborah um, in regards to the peer review, their process, uh, questions about air quality. Uh, I know I've had conversations with several of you, so I wonder, uh, I'll open it up uh, for questions from the HAB. John L. looks like he has his hand up. I missed that. Is that you, Mr. Washington? Are you trying to unmute yourself? Bell. Mr. No, Bell. I know how to unmute myself, but I need <laughs> you something to say. Uh, you know, but you don't unmuted me now, so now I, I got, got you. You know, <laughs> uh, you know, almost lullabied me to sleep for a second there, but um, there were some things that were really key that I thought about. First of all, where did we get a copy of the report? Um, I, I think uh, Megan could send it electronically easily. Yep, yeah, it is, it's currently on the project website, but we'll make sure you get that direct link, Mr. Washington. And this, I, I appreciate that. And the second thing is, is that, okay, we had a, a public uh, announcement about some people suing us for something, right? And, um, how closely related is what they're talking about, what y'all are talking about? It is, uh, it is related. Um, what they're saying is that the traffic data that was provided, that ODOT provided um, as a basis of the analysis that, that they did uh, is not accurate. Um, we were not charged with looking at the traffic analysis, original data, we were looking at the implications of the traffic data that was there. We did ask some questions of ODOT and we got, uh, mostly the information, some of the information Megan gave us gave us today, but um, and she can say it again. But in my lay terms, um, it, it, 
she used the models from the metro area. She used the models from, she used Metro's models and she used the city of Portland's models and they did their analysis. And then what we looked at is given how much traffic was going through that we looked at the air quality analysis that was done. Um, and that's where um, our work was. And so the, the underlying data is what the, somebody's trying to challenge the no freeway people I think are trying to challenge. And um, uh, we, we looked at how that data was applied and found that it was applied appropriately. And Megan's asserting, and we just didn't verify this, that the traffic analysis was done appropriately as well. Okay, so in the noise, in the realization of adjusting the noise from where it is to now with the covers on it, how much of an increase of noise, if, if there is any, that would occur in the study? Uh, Deborah, do you wanna take that question? Um, yeah, you're asking me a, a quantitative answer. Um, That's what you do, isn't it, Deborah? You yes, it is. Yeah, well then come on, quantify. It, it is, uh, um, and, I'm, and I'm sorry, I, I don't know how the report, uh, I didn't open it this morning. Um, the, the, the noise analysis is comparing um, existing and future levels to a, a, a number, which is um, 67, if, 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 it, if FHWA noise analysis um, threshold. And then anything that exceeds that um, qualifies for um, the possibility of looking at whether a barrier would be effective or not. So um, ultimately, the recommendation for mitigation comes down to whether those barriers would be, um, as, I as I mentioned, effective. Are what effective they, are, they have to be feasible and reasonable. And at the moment, um, uh, they, they, they have to um, provide a, a minimum noise reduction, which varies by state. Um, normally it's, it's five to seven, uh, I think five in this case, uh, noise reduction, which is just what that means to you is if a noise increases or decreases by about five, you would say, huh, that, I, I noticed that, okay? Um, if, it, if it reduces by 10, you would say, hmm, that's like a having, you know, it, it just got half as loud even though the energy reduces by a factor of 10, but you only notice it as, as a reduction of half. Um, and then the other part is a, is a cost factor and you know, building a long sound wall to benefit one house does not make any sense. So the, the, the reasonableness calculation takes a look at how many people would be, um, uh, uh, um, would benefit from the, the, the benefit from the wall. And in some cases, there's also a time calculation, um, you know, like the school, the kids are not there all the time. So you have to kind of weigh that into the, the calculation. So the, um, the increase, there, there, is, um, there is a change, um, but the, the, way, the, the way that the noise, the way that noise modeling goes is that, um, you know, if, um, you know, if you if you double the the traffic by a, a factor of two, if you go from a thousand vehicles to two thousand vehicles, you expect that noise is going to increase by three decibels. But if you reduce the traffic speed by a half, um, then um, you would expect that the uh, the noise would would reduce by. Um, sorry, I just put myself in the spot. Um, uh, by by a lot, <laughs> uh, a lot more than three decibels. If you if you decrease that, the, um, can I stop you for speed. just a sec? Yeah. Just because they have other stuff to do. I just yes, want yes. to try an English right. version of this. Here we go, layperson. Um, Thank you. They, no, no, no. You, um, you, Let me frame it before you deliver this layman's message. Uh, you know, because I'm kind of sort of left brained You know, but I am a hunter. You know, and I know muzzle load, right? And so looking at this uh, muzzle capacity, right? Meaning that you have two actual uh, entities within a small confined uh, distance that is gonna be adding change. And one of those changes is the tops, right? The covers, right? So now, and then you're adjusting the sound walls. So mitigate for me the difference between those two things, how you in terms of sound. So if something shoots out of a muzzle, right? because you're going to put a cover on it. So what would the sound effect different be coming after, after you come out of that cover and you hit that sound wall, what is the mitigating realities that is occurring within that span of understanding? 
I'm not a rocket scientist, or right. nothing, but I did understand some things. Right. Um, um, without getting to the weeds. Um, Thank you. I appreciate that. The, I, 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 let me just, um, the, for, for sound in this context, we're not dealing with differences in pressure, which I think part of your, 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 your muzzle and um, analogy well, is assuming, cover. right, but, right but, but even though we're putting a cover on the freeway, or you're all ODOT's putting a cover on the freeway. It's, um, it's you're right that, that it does redirect sound definitely, and it does redirect it toward the, the openings. Um, but it um, uh, and there's some there's some reflective properties of what's going inside. The analysis actually took a conservative approach and didn't really account for the covers in a way. You know, it, it didn't say, oh, the covers are there, let's just reduce everything by you know 25 decibels or something. It 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 took a very conservative, that is to say, a very small effect from the covers. And then you know, then you also have the portals, which has some changes. Um, so uh, there's a lot more modeling that could be done to take a look at that, but it kind of falls outside the the scope of what's normally done for an environmental analysis. Um, and uh, to your to your question about you know, I think I think the the question you're answering, question, you know, the cover reduces noise, without a doubt. There is some effect at the portals, um, but even even with that effect, the noise, um, you know, is less. So that's the the bottom line. So my version would be: there's a before and after noise. So you got what we have today, and after the project, what we would have, and then there is an impact. Okay, and then. ODOT suggests mitigation and the committee affirmed that the mitigation they proposed will work, is proper mitigation, will work and is cost effective. ODOT had three walls that they wanted to put up to help solve the problem. Two of the walls are cost effective. One of the walls was not. And we asked them to reanalyze the one that was not to see if it could help. And then what Deborah was trying to say, or just to restate the, the tunnel thing, um, they didn't take in the added benefit of the cover on some cases, and there is an added benefit to the cover. They did take into the impact. It would have the negative input, but not the positive. So it will be a little bit better than what they, repre than what they represent. Thank you all for that. I wanna just shift to you. I see that Andrew H Campbell uh, has had his hand up for a moment. I wanna take one more question uh, for the panel. Oh, hey, good evening, everyone. Um, I was just curious about like why the the lack of quantitative data that was in the uh, assessment. I've noticed too that was one of the areas of concern that was on the environment environmental assessment fact sheet. Um, and yeah, that's all. Andrew, I think that there was quite a bit of um, analysis on noise and air, but there wasn't much uh, data to compare things with on greenhouse gas. So in as much as air is different than greenhouse gas, air quality is different than greenhouse gas, and there is some overlap. There's no federal standards to measure against. There's no, um, uh, the data, when we said there wasn't much there, it, it's just that they don't, there's not a process already laid out for them to go through. So they did what they could. Um, and we thought they did more than we've seen in other documents before, but that um, uh, there wasn't, it, it, it's because the, the standards aren't there. The whole country's not used to doing this. Thank you for the question. Indeed, thank you. I want to thank Grace and Dr. Scott uh, and Deborah. I don't know if Song was on the line as well. Um, I don't know if you had technical difficulties, but thank you all uh, for joining us. I know, um, and I appreciate uh, um, your commitment to this. I know if you have members, if you all have other questions, you could send them my way. I'll make sure uh, that we're responsive uh, to your thoughts and your questions as you may have some develop uh, as we move along. Uh, but I just want to uh, appreciate Grace, you and your, your team for joining us tonight. Uh, Miss Natalie, if you'd put, yes, go ahead. Erica, this is Megan. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to jump back to uh, Mr. Washington's question. I was able to pull up the technical report in the tables just to um, look at the difference between existing versus the project. 
Um, and so the, the project, depending on location, uh, Mr. Washington, in some locations, the noise is lower uh, than existing condition with the project. And in some locations, it's higher. And where it is higher, um, the increase is a three DBA increase. Um, and so uh, I think as, as Deborah was, or Deborah, I can turn it over to you on sort of what that means, but I wanted to get that data in front of you, Mr. Washington, um, this evening. Thank you very much for that, Megan. But is that yeah. data indicating that near the, near the school, is that decibel rising or is it lowering? Um, I can, I will have to follow up with you at, kind of on point by point. We can show you a map of the different locations um, and where that, um, where those, where those are. And it, near the school, it does vary um, depending on where those point locations were taken. Um, and so I don't, I, I would rather share the map um, and that table with the full group if that's amenable to you. There must be some impact near the school because there is a wall that we looked at that could be moved. It, it could help more if you moved it closer to the school. If the school district's willing to do that, it would have both noise and air quality benefits by moving that wall closer to the school. If they, it's on a slope, so if they can afford to to give up some of that uh, real estate, um, you could benefit. So I know you wouldn't have a wall there if you didn't have the impacts. Good. Exactly. And to my understanding, that's really where the, the impetus of this issue of sound and, and that type of thing is really where the main concern is, right? Because in the other span of that, I guess the front end of the cover coming into that cover is not so much of a concern, but coming out of the covers and into the school section is primarily what we're actually in contention about, right? In terms of uh, increase versus decrease. So just so that I'm understanding is that little span is what we're talking about. So when you enter it, you got one air, one noise quality, but you enter that and it decreases, but yet you shoot out of that muzzle and then you add a certain kind of wall or whatever that is, a sound wall that you're going to do. So what we're still talking about is when you exit those cover areas and hit the school zone, is that's the zone that we're talking about where the noise and noise and fluctuation could potentially be an issue, right? Right, and that's what we're saying is that they identified that, they've got some mitigation and you could make it even better if you moved it up. And if you go through, do some research, not you, but if ODOT do some research on some other techniques, there's things you can do to make it better than what it, even they're suggesting you can make it. Thank you. Let me just say one thing, sorry. Um, and sorry for not having this open uh, in front of me. Um, the existing noise levels are already quite high, as I think everybody acknowledges. And you know, whether it changes, you know, goes up or goes down slightly throughout the corridor, it is still high. So um, pretty much almost everywhere it qualifies for looking at a barrier, which is what the uh, ODOT then did. And, um, uh, and the school is actually on the, the border of, of an impact um, taking into account the the cover and the and the uh, the tunnel effect, and that that has that is in the, in the report, um, just a, a relatively simple analysis. Thanks, Deborah, for jumping in there. I appreciate uh, the conversation, Mr. Washington. Thank you for your question. Uh, hopefully, we can provide those links to you uh, and get some more of that data to you as well, Andrew. Um, and hopefully that explanation helped you to understand why uh, the quantitative wasn't there uh, in regards to not having much to compare it to it. Grace, uh, eloquently always, Dr. Scott, thank you, Deborah, for being with us. Uh, Natalie, if you would uh, share the slides again, I would love to uh, move into um, the baseline explained. Uh, we have a great uh, presentation from our architecture and engineering team. I want to remind you all that I provided uh, to you today at noon. Um, as Andrew mentioned, there's an air quality one sheet, a brief description of the project history, as well um, as a description of the environmental assessment for you all to peruse at your leisure. Please, if you have questions in regards to those documents, uh, to jot them down, and I will make sure that we um, are responsive to your requests. Steve, I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> well, uh, good evening, HAB members. Thanks for having me back today. Um, I will be joined by one of my colleagues named James McGrath, who is our urban design lead, to help uh, the this fun topic of the baseline explained. And we're going to do that in two parts. 
the first part is really in response to a question that was brought up at the last meeting. And um, if we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, at the last meeting, I spent some time talking about what was happening on I-5 and the different cross sections and the way in which traffic would get onto I-5, get off of I-5, work between I-405 and 84, and what these auxiliary lanes and, and the other things mean. Today's focus is really what's happening on top, on the surface streets, the local streets, on the highway cover, um, and we're gonna be talking about each of those two elements which um, are highlighted in yellow in the, in the arrows. So James McGrath, who I briefly introduced, is our urban design lead. Um, he's gonna be talking about what does the existing NEPA baseline concept mean from a potential highway cover use standpoint. And so this is, I'm sure, um, a lot of information that's gonna come your way. He, uh, he has a lot of information to present. He's, he's fantastic at talking about what this means. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to handing it over to him. But before we do that, there was the question of, with this new highway cover and with this uh, baseline project, what are the new ways in which you're gonna get onto I-5? So I'm gonna share that with you, give a little bit of an existing condition standpoint, and then how is the new uh, local street system gonna be serving access onto I-5? So with that, let's uh, move right into this part. So really the setup question is, how does the street system change in the baseline concept, this NEPA concept, the environmental concept? So we're gonna first look at these different directions on how to get to somewhere. In this case, the existing condition for I-5 northbound. And so before we get into it, um, this view is basically you're hovering above the Moda Center looking north. And so the freeway I-5 is on your right-hand side moving diagonally across. And at the very upper left, you'll see the I-5 symbol NB, which stands for northbound. And so we're gonna go through a different series of routes to get to northbound access. So as you click, um, the first direction is on Broadway. So if you're on Broadway heading west, you would basically take a quick right on Williams and then jump right on to I-5 northbound. The other direction, if you hit click, please, if you take Widler, um, I think we all know this, we, you take Widler until you get to Williams, you go north on Williams, and then you pop on to I-5. Next route is if you're coming south on Vancouver, you have to have loop around a little bit, uh, coming down onto Widler, then Williams, and again, back again on I-5, and then click again, um, in this case, you're going from north to south, all the way up from base of the Moda Center, up Williams, and you get onto I-5. So that's the existing condition, which we all know and love when there isn't a lot of traffic. Um, and then as you hit the next slide, it's really how does this project transition into the new infrastructure? And so again, taking the same exact view, the blue again is the highway cover. And in this case, you're seeing the different streets that are on top of the highway cover and in and around the project. And so we'll take those same street routes. So click number one, will be on Broadway. It looks very similar to the existing. Uh, the only difference is that you drop underneath the highway cover for a little stretch as it goes underneath Vancouver. And so this is where the highway cover acts like a little bit of a tunnel, uh, but still you have this entry corridor that drops you onto I-5. Then click the next one on Widler, very similar to what's out there today. Again, the only difference is just that little bit of uh, going underneath the highway cover. The next route is Vancouver. And in this case, Vancouver and Flint are really the same. The Flint connection is being replaced with a Hancock Street extension. And so the traffic that is on Flint would actually get onto Vancouver and create this loop around to get onto I-5 northbound. So this project is pretty similar for the northbound entry. Very, very similar to what's out there today. The other direction, however, is where the change really occurred. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped one. And if you're coming up Moda Center, then you would uh, come up Wheeler instead of Williams, and then you make a right on Widler and then get back onto Williams. And as you hit click again, the reason for this is because there are some dedicated bus only routes that are taking us up onto Williams. And this is whether it's buses getting from or coming on from Winning Way or buses coming up the side of the Moda Center. This bus only route really helps to uh, increase or increase their availability, decrease travel time for buses. And so this is the one adjustment that 
is a strong improvement for transit and trying to make sure that those transit times are, are more predictable and reliable. So now we'll click over to the southbound direction. In this case, there's a little bit more of a change. Uh, we're gonna take you through the same series of different movements. So as we click number one, the first movement is Broadway. Um, and so in this existing condition, you go west on Broadway, you come down Vancouver, you come across Wheeler, and then you get onto the freeway pretty close to the Moda Center. And that southbound location is where most of these, well, all these routes are gonna get to. So we click on the next one, and it's the route for, uh, for Widler getting onto Wheeler. Um, next click is what happens if you come down Vancouver. And then the next click is if you come down Flint. So a whole series of different routes that are very consistent with which we all know and experience every day. So as we move to the next slide, it'll move to the baseline project and the change to go southbound. And in this case, this is one of the more significant adjustments. Um, and if you take Broadway westward, instead of going all the way over to Vancouver, looping down Wheeler, which is shown in the red path, there's a direct connection on Williams. And this Williams, as you look at it, really consists of two streets. So you saw before how if you're gonna head on I-5 northbound, you're on the left uh, section of Williams. In this case, where the yellow line is, you're on the right section of Williams, creating essentially what's gonna be called a contraflow. And a different, different graphic is gonna show how this movement really happens. Um, so this is the one direction, so if you, um, then are coming going eastbound on Widler. You would do the same thing where you extend beyond the Wheeler uh, Street and then go directly onto the on ramp that drops you directly into the freeway. And the next movement is if you're on Vancouver, this is where you come down across Vancouver, um, make a left onto Widler, and then drop directly onto the access uh, ramp onto the freeway itself. So. When you put these two movements together, you have this contraflow. And so the William Street contraflow is this term that you'll hear over time. And so today's introduction of what this really means. So if you start with where the, the, the dots are, that's your starting point, your arrows at the end are your um, ending points. And what you notice is those two lines, the yellow and the red never intersect. And that's really important for this change in operations that's gonna be out here. By avoiding these crossover points, you avoid a lot of mixing between modes, mixing between vehicles, pauses, transit impacts, bicycle, pedestrian conflicts, um, each of these different things. And so this contraflow really works in a way to separate these different travel patterns to optimize the system, to help improve the system. And on the next slide, you can really see where these points are, each of these, red um, blotches indicate some form of significant conflict that exists today that creates partially the delays that you see, partially the, the congestion that you see. And so by removing, if you click on the next slide, please, by removing some of the vehicles, whether it's 300 or 400 cars um, at the street for Vancouver on the left, 500 or 600 cars that are traversing on on Broadway itself through Williams, and that this north-south bicycle route that runs right through the middle of it, you can avoid a lot of the conflicts, create a safer space, and frankly, improve operations overall. So this is the hallmark of what is happening with the local streets. And it took what, 75 different options that were studied and analyzed and, and looked at to realize that this one is really the best of all worlds, the sort of the optimized solution the balance trade-off across all the different modes. And this is uh, at the hallmark of our project from the baseline standpoint. So there's a lot more detail that's gonna come over time, but we at least wanted to introduce this question and or introduce this discussion and respond to the question that came up at the last meeting about how exactly is the project gonna be getting onto I-5? So is this adjustment as, as it's shown? So with that, the question is, what kind of space remains? Um, for development. And this is what's really, really important. So on that last picture, you saw some, some graphics of blue. And so with this, I'm gonna hand it over to James McGrath, again, our urban design lead. He and Bill Hart worked together, uh, hand in glove to come up with the different concepts 
um, and really explore the technical feasibility that comes from what can you do to potentially build something on top of these highway cover spaces. And again, this is, a, an, I'll do another plug on behalf of uh, Gina. Um, with this context of what the baseline is, please reach out and go to those highway cover assessment workshops and use this as a starting point to see how other options could morph off of these. Um, keeping in mind that, yeah, well, this is, might be the NEPA baseline um, and this is what the EA has embedded into it. There could be other options that, that unfold. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to James um, to show you some really awesome slides of what could be, even based on this baseline cover up idea. Thank you, Steve. And uh, thank you for having me to all the HAB members. Uh, I'm the Urban Design Task Lead, and what that means to me is I'm responsible for trying to integrate the infrastructure project with the people places, make those two things work together. Uh, we embarked on some technical work to understand the issues of uh, open spaces and buildings on the covers uh, in anticipation of the recommendations and the outcomes that would come from the independent covers assessment. So these are technical explorations uh, meant to help us get calibrated and get ready um, to deliver the goods uh, when decisions get made, to set the table through the infrastructure project for the complementary action that might occur uh, based on the visions and the outcomes uh, of the independent coverage assessment. So the work that I'm presenting today is by no, mean, uh, no means a recommendation or a decision. Uh, so with that, as a preamble, I'll jump in. Um, continuing on the uh, before and after, uh, on the left is, is the existing condition that you know uh, uh, and understand so well today. On the right uh, is a, uh, a planned depiction of the extent of the cover in, in turquoise uh, and some key, three key sites that we identified in that expanse uh, that we'll be discussing in, in some detail. Uh, and I think you can go ahead and click. Uh, north, as always, is up. If there's anything in terms of orientation, I will do my best. The extent of the cover um, has changed over time and certainly since, uh, uh, since the project started to this snapshot in this moment in time, uh, it is one contiguous uh, cover. It spread uh, its wings a little bit to the north and the south. So um, next slide. There are uh, a number, because of the complexities of the geometry, right? We have an urban grid, the north, south, east, west grid. Uh, of the majority of, of Portland and inner Portland intersecting with the geometry uh, of the freeway, which follows its own logic, there is complexity in the space. The covers have to do uh, the work of holding up the local streets and to reconnect that grid. Um, and, and the result is some complex shapes, a lot of triangles, uh, which is really the origin of the three main sites. By the time the large cover is broken up and doing all of the transportation work for bicycles and pedestrians and transit and vehicles, um, there are really just three sites that we identified and studied that are at a scale that makes sense, uh, particularly for buildings, uh, but also for really uh, programmed open spaces. Keep going. Here's another depiction of that oriented uh, in a more three-dimensional way to just to say um, these are the sites that we explored uh, on structure, on covers, on bridges um, at various scales. We'll get into that. Um, and you can see them in their context, the relative scale of these uh, developments in comparison to uh, buildings you know that are adjacent. So there are sites that we'll talk about that are on covers. Next slide. There are also sites uh, directly adjacent to the cover, immediately adjacent uh, to the covers uh, that I'll also touch on. Uh, and again, this is uh, initial exploration, not decisions. We're trying to get some facts on the table and get ourselves prepared for what might, what might come out of the uh, ICA process. Keep going. So we looked at three big questions. Um, what are the potential uses we should get prepared for? Um, and we looked at open spaces, uh, but we also looked at uh, public buildings. Um, next slide, we also were looking at what was the appropriate shape. When we inherited the, the design of the project, there were particular shapes uh, for the covers. Um, what we were allowed to do was explore what are some different shapes that might uh, create more opportunity or provide for more opportunity. Um, so we really didn't look backwards at the previous shapes. We really looked forward uh, trying to maximize what the cover uh, system could do. 
Um, and then the last thing we looked at was uh, what's the scale? What can we hold up? What can we accommodate? Again, not decisions, just an exploration about what can the baseline do? What can we do with the structures and the footprint that we have uh, in our NEPA clearance? So we looked at one and two story buildings and we looked at three and five story buildings as, as a range to do some technical work. And that's really what this is. Keep going. So I wanna share with you, I'm gonna sort of go to the end and come back. Um, we'll, we'll definitely talk about some of the design options, um, but because those design options are really just confections uh, of our uh, designers without the benefit of talking to you, right? We, we had to do this uh, without the benefit of a lot of public process. Um, I want to talk to you about some of the assumptions we made and some of the high level takeaways. So the first thing that we noticed is that the cover is big, but the developable areas and this is specific to buildings, are smaller than the extents of the covers. First of all, the covers have to do work for the local streets. They have to hold up those local streets. But there's also some structural uh, rules and logics that we assumed. We didn't decide for the project, but we assumed that no building should both be on a bridge and also on land adjacent to the bridge. In other words, no building, no development should span the gap. And there's lots of reasons, and we can dive into those reasons. Um, but what those, uh, what this means is that the, this is the origin of, of there are three main sites that we wanted to look at. And then there's some other fragments of space um, that we think have promise for other and complementary uses. Next slide. The other thing, uh, some other rules that we uh, thought prudent and that we wanted to follow were not only do local roads take up space on the covers and you have to avoid the joints, um, but there are some other things around access and maintenance. There are also some concerns around fire and life safety. And these concerns told us that we should set back from the edges, that we should be aware of the edge conditions um, and allow for travel ways and maintenance ways and inspection uh, uh, site access that further uh, constrained or limited or started to, to box in the area for vertical development. Um, it's easier to accommodate those offsets and those maintenance uh, walkways uh, or driveways in a landscape and open space situation, but you'll see their consequence rendered uh, when we get into buildings. Next one. The other really important thing is that what's happening down below really does matter to what can happen up above. Um, we have been talking and I think it's, it's uh, understandable that we have a number of northbound lanes that we have to have a clear span we have a number of southbound lanes. So we essentially have these two barrels uh, underneath us. But as we migrate to the north end of the project, because of the ramp geometry, the, the bridges have to change. They're longer bridges, they have to span further. So there's some structural complexity underneath. And it really does have a relationship to what can happen up above. There are some rules that emerge or assumptions that we made uh, about how these two things relate, even though you don't see it. It actually has consequences for where you might put a building foundation or where you might put a building edge. Uh, in short, the heavier the objects on the cover, the deeper the structure is needed to hold it up. That's uh, fairly common sense. Um, so the bigger the stuff, the bigger the bridge. And what we know and what we found out is that we can push the highway down a bit, about a foot, to accommodate some of that increase. If the bridge has to get uh, wider, the bridge that holds up the cover, it has to get thicker. Uh, we can push the roadway, uh, the highway down uh, uh, about a foot, but if that won't do it and we need more structure to hold up big things, what winds up happening is the whole surface kind of ha has to lift up. We still need that hole in the sky for the freeway and then we need a thicker bridge. So what it means is that the, the, the surface of the covers have to lift up um, and that can be problematic when we're trying to stitch these streets and these places back into the existing condition. So um, it's, it's a balance point and we were trying to find that balance, balance point. I'm not saying we found it perfectly. There's many creative solutions that can occur, uh, but it's important for you to understand that relationship. Next one. The other thing is for buildings in particular, uh, buildings need utilities, they need wet utilities, they need technological utilities, and sometimes they need vertical circulation systems. Uh, if it's a multi-story building, it's going to need an elevator. And so we wanted to be uh, honest with ourselves and explore what does it take to serve a building on structure? And it's complicated. 
uh, not just because each of these buildings are gonna need essentially a crawl space between the top of the bridge and the ground floor, that will change the relationship or has the potential to change the relationship of the building to the sidewalk adjacent. Uh, and there, we care about these things in, in Portland. There are rules around how buildings have to behave uh, uh, next to the street. Um, but this is somewhat uncharted territory for us, how all of these systems will get into and out of the building. And so it's important to recognize that we're gonna have to stuff some things in and not all of those things can be below the bridge deck and in between the bridge deck and the highway below. So we're thinking there's some sort of utility space that will change the relationship of the building to uh, its context. Next. Next slide, please. Now, the other thing to mention is that it, I had pointed to there's three main sites, but there are also complementary sites, sites that are might be impacted by the project or acquired by the project that are off cover. And it's, um, we explored what are the possibilities of those sites. Those sites are generally governed by the existing zoning uh, because they are uh, currently private property. They're governed by height and bulk and all sorts of uh, types of uses. But in a lot of cases, they're directly adjacent. And we believe there's a really fruitful relationship that can occur between a development that's off structure, uh, a more uh, commonplace uh, structural solution, a building solution, but that we could blur the boundary between that and the on covers things. This happens to be right in the middle of the project where there's a, a potential development site that is off structure, but perhaps the parking lot or the plaza environment that serves that building and complements that building can happen uh, on the covers. So uh, it's an important thing to, uh, to note that, that the covers provide opportunity to stitch these places together uh, in ways that aren't exclusively about building buildings. Next slide. Okay, so uh, those are some takeaways, lots to talk about. We're excited, we're really excited to get the Q&A, but before we do, I wanted to share with you just some images of the work that we did and explore and, and depict some of the trade-offs and consequences. So the first is, again, without the benefit of talking really to the community in a deep way or talking to you, we created a propositional, what if the covers were used for public realm, for open spaces, for parks, for play spaces? And this is, uh, it's just an idea so that we could explore technical issues around could we plant trees? Where could we plant trees? Could we have a water feature? What would it take to get a play, a level playing field? The truth is the covers provide, the baseline concept provides a really strong platform for lots of open space and landscape solutions. Um, we looked at um, uh, the cover extents that were shorter and tighter. We looked at the cover extents that were uh, expanded. The truth is we have lots of flexibility with open space. And it's also important to note that even if we were to put buildings on these, a lot of the other space around uh, that is still gonna be on the covers will need to accommodate landscape. Um, and so the ideas and the lessons learned here will apply to whatever the future solution is. Next slide. Um, the covers, even if you piled a bunch of dirt on those covers so you get the right amount of soil volume to plant trees, uh, which we'll have to do, um, it, th this is a relatively thin crust. So it means that the open space solutions are very easy to stitch back into the adjacent streets and communities and places. And there's not a structural premium to do so. Um, we can fit open space uh, solutions and creative ideas um, clearly and easily within the baseline. That's really the point. Um, the more complex options, next slides, uh, will come when we start talking about buildings. So um, keep going. The next slide will go from north to south. Uh, this is a depiction of how landscape and buildings might work together. Um, you can see that there's a, a, a building that is north of Hancock. Um, and, and you'll also note that you know the, the project's geometry changes. Hancock is in flux. So the site north of Hancock's is also in flux. Um, but the, the premier site that we imagined was at, in the middle site because it was the largest site. And there's a relatively small site at the south that we'll get into. Um, but let's, let's go dive into that north site. Um, I don't wanna talk really about assumptions about what's in the building or whatnot. We were looking at what's the right footprint, what's a, what's a reasonable footprint. And this is where Bill Hart uh, and his team really shines. 
They do architecture in Portland of all sorts all the time. Uh, and so they helped us uh, scheme these buildings as well as the access that is required uh, for a lot of these buildings. Here's a, an example of where you can see that we've left a drive aisle between the edge of the cover. We've set that building back. We've made that space do uh, double duty, landscape buffer, drive aisle, uh, but also pushes the edge of the building away from uh, the edge of the structure. Um, and we, because of the length of spans, next slide, because of the length of spans up here on the north cover, um, we think a one-story uh, building is feasible. Um, lots more design has to be done. Um, a two-story building at the north cover is feasible, but we're going to have to get into way more detail. And we think that in the baseline context, anything taller than two stories really doesn't make sense or is not accommodatable, uh, if that's even a word. Three stories is unlikely uh, on the north cover. Let's jump to the middle site. Um, on the middle site, we looked at a range of uses. This is really um, the signature site. It's both the largest site at scale, but it also has sort of what I would call a civic address. It's on Broadway, but it's also visible from Vancouver and Williams. So it's sort of right in the heart of the area. And uh, it could be residential, it could be commercial. This, this site I think has a lot of uh, flexibility. Next slide will show you that this is also the place where we think two stories is accommodatable, again, within the baseline. A third story is probable, uh, if not likely. And then when we get into the, the stories that are above that four and five, it's really a stretch to fit that into the existing project, into the existing baseline. Remember, the taller it gets, the deeper the structure gets, we can only push the surface of the highway below down a certain amount. So any, anything that gets bigger, we have to lift up that street and then we got to sweeten it back and tie it back into the adjacent uh, streets. So it's getting challenging when we're in that four to five zone, uh, or four to five stories in the middle zone. Next slide. Uh, South site uh, presents some unique and perhaps different constraints. Uh, it may be hard to see in this graphic, but the South site is sort of landlocked. It's between two ramps. So you can't turn off a ramp and get into a driveway. So it's really, it's, it's only frontage and access is on Weidler itself, and that constrains it. Either we have to circulate around the building and we're thinking for things like trash and recycling and other kind of building services, or those things are foisted out onto the street, but that street is doing a lot of work. There's pedestrians, there's a cycle facility, there's a bus stop, and then there's the through lanes. So this one is constrained by the geometry of the ramps and the geometry of the street. Um, and that is really the limiting factor. The structural system that underpins this site is the same as the middle site, meaning you could go a little bit bigger. But what constrains this and what, what in our estimation constrained the opportunity was it sort of hemmed in. So this is a relatively small building. Next, uh, next slide. Um, you could do a multi-story building here, uh, one story or two stories. Um, but in fact, it's the site geometry that limits it. Um, but there again, those, those assumptions and those, um, those things can be challenged. So I think that's my last slide. It, can we advance the slide or am I one slide behind? I'm not sure. Are we having some technical difficulties there, Natalie? Unable to advance the slides? Perfect. While we, we just have a few moments, I wanna give an opportunity. Thanks, Steve and James. I wanna give an opportunity for uh, HAB members to ask questions. Um, from the A&E team. Um, is there anyone who has specific questions? Again, of course, we're always open to, um, you know, forwarding your comments and, and hopefully being responsive to those things that you have questions about, uh, but wanted to take a moment uh, to give an opportunity if you all have anything pressing at this moment. You know, I'm sorry to be the one to talk on this one, but I'm pretty. It's excited. okay. I'm, well, you know, he must have heard me the last time he left away from around here. You know, and you know, I am really excited about seeing what you guys brought back. You know, for the first time, I sort of got my hands around what this real project looks like. You know, and I do appreciate that from y'all. I mean, y'all did a really good job of laying that out to where it doesn't seem like it hit this or it impeded that or it was it. So you showed me a little, a few things that were really excited. And so I want to thank you for that because uh, you sort of clearly defined what those tops and the capacities and all those things 
So, um, and so now I feel really informed about what this project really looks like, potentially could look like, you know? Uh, so th there was just one of the things that I might've had a little bit of an objection about, but the fact that these covers can carry buildings and structures and those types of things, I think that that's the target for where we're trying to get to, at least in my book. And the other part was the reason why I did not support the park part of this, and so that you get this real clear, y'all, so that I, that I don't mix my messages. To me, the park concept in this reality here just seems to add to the gentrification, okay? If it, you know, where I kind of went to school at, which was uh, Ivy Lake School, urban studies, community development simply mean black people removal, okay? And it's real clear to me that when you continue the projects that you already got going on on Williams and David, I mean, Williams and, and Vancouver, if you played into that park concept, all you would have done is to add convenience to that sense of direction in which we're going. And that is a gentrified direction. Okay, so the park concept, the mixed use concept, I really appreciated that. I think that there's some potential in that model. It adds an opportunity for some upside in the, in the real estate reality of this uh, space for us to get some new constructs and concepts and all that back in it. And then it adds some of that, that outdoorsy kind of natural air quality type of thing that we were really actually looking for as a healthier neighborhood and healthier opportunities for our community. Um, the one last thing was that, which popped into my mind about it too, was that when we were earlier speaking about air quality and that air quality in this situation around those buildings are gonna be somehow or another mitigated and, and really has to be really looked at in the potential for what that actually looks like because the way you got all those ramps and how you're redirecting on all that, you're gonna build a higher density of traffic movement in about and around those buildings. So, um, so there was just a little bit concerned for me about that and so in understanding that. And when you see Bill, you tell Bill, I appreciate some of the constructs in which he added to that reality. I think that it adds a little bit. So y'all got a good positive strike for me today, but you know, just keep up the good work and keep it moving in the right direction. But I think that whole structural, whole load bearing uh, tops and how you had it all laid out and the redirection of the traffic, you know, Broadway was where my real concern was for our district at least. And so, you know, how much interruption and how much traffic and, and stuff are gonna mitigate our business sector in that area and all that sort of was a, is a little bit of a concern to me, but I like where you guys are headed with this part of it. Thank you for allowing me some reprieve so I didn't have to work so damn hard to get to what it was that I'm sitting here to help y'all get to, you know? So, so with that said, I appreciate, appreciate you, all right? Thank you, Mr. Washington. I always could look to you. Yeah, Steve and James uh, and the A&E team, um, as I've mentioned to you um, outside of this venue, thank you for your work. Um, I think it's important for the community to know uh, what's included so they know how to make a great informed decision. Um, with that, Historic Albina Advisory Board members, if you have other thoughts or questions, I know you're thinking of them. Um, I know uh, in our one-on-ones, there'll be an opportunity for us to continue to dialogue around this presentation. Uh, as well, you can send me uh, your messages, uh, emails, uh, so that we can elevate that up to the team and to leadership to be responsive. Um, with that, I'm going to move further into our meeting. I want to be conscious of your time. Thank you for your patience. I'm gonna turn things over to Ms. Jessica Stanton. Uh, she was tasked with helping us to um, redevelop the branding in line with the values of this project. So Ms. Jessica, I'll turn it to you. Thank you so much, Erica. Um, good evening, board members. It's wonderful to see you all. Um, just one moment. Um, I am, it looks like my uh, screen sharing is okay. Um, sorry about that. Can you all see my screen? Okay, great. So I just wanna take a moment to, um, to, to look at this uh, quote from uh, former Senator Avell Gordley. We are here, we were here and still are here. I wanna thank the Gordley family for the contributions they've made to this project and this process. But I think the reason we're featuring this quote is that we think it really captures the essence of this project. You know, what's important um, that this is, this is about a community that is here 
that is continues to be here and will still be here. Um, even if we're not physically together, it's a community that is here and it is all this, this quote captures that. So this is our agenda. Uh, we wanna talk about why there was a rebrand, um, our process, top takeaways, where we are now. But the most important thing is where are we going? And what is that? What does the new brand look like? And what is your decision about that new brand? So ODOT and the project team decided to rebrand the project last year with, with the understanding, they identified the need to rebrand the project. Um, the current project branding was created during the prior env environmental planning phase, and it lo no longer fits the present project emphasis on restorative justice and equity for Black Portlanders. The, the shift in this focus and is engaging on the engaging the Black community. It, I'm so sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm just having a moment here. So. As you know, the, the, shift, the project shifted to focus on restorative justice and equity for Black Portlanders and the historic Albina community. So with this shift, you really needed a new identity to reflect the new project values and to also accept that you might be a part of the community discourse in many, for many years to come. So what does that new brand need to look like? What does it need to say? What does it need to be? The purpose of the whole new brand is for the community and historic Albina advisory board members to, to be profiled and to be a part of this profiled. Project. Holy shit. Oops, sorry about that. <laughs> um, I don't mean profiled, please, uh, please forgive me for that. That was a mistake. So let's just talk quickly about what our process was. Our process is to put the community vision forward. It's, it's, to, it's to raise up what your values are, what your ideas are, what you think that this project needs to be. So as I've mentioned before, our process involves, is it's a branding process. We start with discovery, we move to conceptualization, and then we do design and implementation. So let's just talk a little bit about what we discovered. Like what was the first part of our process? We spent the past three months engaged in one-on-one -on -one conversations with up to 23 stakeholders. And some of those conversations were recurring. Those were community members, they were board members, and a select group of project team members. We also attended the independent cover assessment community workshops that were held in February. We got to hear from the, we went to both of the workshops and we got to hear from community members what their vision is about the covers and what, what their ideals are, what their values are for what Albina means today and what it means going forward. We also held a youth focus group in March and we got to hear from young students what their ideas are about Albina today and about historic Albina and about urban renewal and how they really wanna be a part of this process. The interesting thing about the youth is that they really sounded like you board members. We really, we really enjoyed talking to them and listening to them to hear what their values are and how we should influence this brand going forward. So the, our process ends up being creating a vision, a vision of your brand, of the community, what, what this project is. So we create a vision summary and that is the vision that we use to guide the design going forward. So let's talk about what our top takeaways were. I love this quote, honor the memories of people, the sacrifices they made for progress, for the community to inspire us to build better in the present and future. This quote is about remembrance and our opportunity to build something. Better. And I think that really talks about a lot of the takeaways and a lot of what we heard from community members as we, as we talk to people about this brand. So more about what the top takeaways were. Albina was a flourishing culture of families, beautiful lives, black owned businesses. It was an oasis of up and it was, it was a place that was safe. It was, it, was, it was their place and something that they owned. This is also a historic brand. Obviously there's there are real factual events that we understand that helps shape and impact what the brand is. This is a personal brand. This is about people. 
with historic influences. There are individuals and family stories that are interwoven into what, what happened to Albina and what, what can happen to Albina. This is about, this is a brand about community events and experiences of inequity, displacement, redlining, disinvestment, and unwelcoming. This is also about the long-standing tension between urban development and community well-being. So this is, we heard so much about the, the facts of what happened to Albina. And I think, you know, I'm not gonna go into the detail of what those facts are, but, but the point is to see this orbit, this swirl of events that have happened to, to Albina and to the community members, to know that these events you know, they may have happened a long time ago. You know, the Memorial Coliseum was built in the 50s. The Vanport flood was in 1948. Legacy Emanuel Hospital was in 1970. You know, the Great Migration was in 1940. These events live large in the community and the people that we talk to. It doesn't matter how long ago it was. It matters that it happened and it still is impacting the community and individuals. So I think it's really important to understand this swirl of events and how there's just there's an orbit of activity that influenced this brand. But what I want you to take a look at is in the center of the slide, we're showing a nexus between the I-5 Rose Quarter project and Albina. What is that nexus? And it's, there's something happening in the center. There are all these events that happen, but there's something happening in the center that's something we think is really special. We're not sure what it is, but something is building in the center. And we think that all these events have culminated in the project today. So this is what we heard. It's more takeaways about what, what Albina is and what the stories were shared with us from community stakeholders. Albina is abundance. One of the stakeholders, when I asked her, what are your stories about Albina? What would you like to share with me about Albina? The first thing she said is abundance. It was an abundant life. It was a great life. I, 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 went to, I loved going to school. I, I shared time with my, my family neighborhood. I, I, it was an abundant life. It was a rich life. And I, I want you to know that it's too many times our story starts with a deficit. But Albina was not that. It was abundant. Other stakeholders talked about reclamation. I want to reclaim what was lost. Businesses, homes, twice to our family. Other, other stakeholders talked about the need and the desire and the goal for wealth creation. And other stakeholders said, we want a 100 year legacy. We want a legacy. We want to claim that. And then other stakeholders talked about different things, the, the transitions that occurred in Albina, you know, the celebration of jazz and music. There's a strong, rich culture that exists in Albina. And then the sense of home and family, Black-owned businesses, and then the desire for climate justice and the arts. All of these things are still current, but those were also things that have come from the past. So this is kind of the, the top level takeaways of what we heard about Albina. And then this is, I'm not going to go through every detail, but this is just to spark your memory about some of the joyful existence of the past and the current and what Albina is. Albina is family and community and home. And more, more ideas about the families and the communities and the homes. Here's pictures of, of Dean's beauty salon and barbershop still there. More stories. This is Pastor Probrasco's grandmother, Rosa Marie Cerci. She had 12 children and she was here, you know, th this is a picture from the 1920s. More of her stories. This is the, the Afro-American Afro Heritage Bicentennial Commemorative Quilt. This is a contribution of, of, of 15 members, 15 community members that, that created this quilt. And this is a picture that the, the Jackson Love family shared with us. More about our voices. Activism has been a huge part of the Albina, Albina story and it continues to be. More about our voices. Our art and our culture. This is so rich.
So let's talk about where we are now with the brand. This is the current brand. It is a, it's a good brand for a transportation project. Um, this is the icon and then this is the name. And just to remind ourselves, the name is not gonna change, but this is the current brand. This is where we are now. So where do we wanna go? I think this quote really captures that. All hands on deck. This is a generational opportunity. At some point, the question is, what is it that we wanna leave behind? Let's ask ourselves that question. So where are we growing, going? We're creating a brand that acknowledges the project values and honors historic Albina and Black Portlanders. We want to open doors, continue to open doors for restorative justice. I think that restorative justice is occurring. This community has led those efforts in restorative justice for decades. Discover the nexus between historic Albina and the project. And we wanna connect the vision of the community of stakeholders to this project. That's where we're going. So this next, before I move into what identities and what brands, we, what direction we came up with the brands, I just want to, to pause for a moment and say that, so, so where are we going? We're, we're trying to create a brand that captures all of that that we just talked about, captures what you already know, what you're working on, what you've been doing as board members. What's the brand look like? What does it need to be? So we've had some design processes. Uh, we've had conversations with stakeholders and tried to narrow it down to about two directions. So one direction has is split. We've got a couple, we've got an option and then we have another direction. So there's two directions. Let's take a look at the first direction. So back to the quote, we are here, we were here and we still are here. We think this quote captures this first direction. So this is the I-5 Rose Quarter Albina North Star. This is the, the typog typography and you can see that it's modular. It can be horizontal, it can go vertical. And then this is this beautiful element that this is the North Star. The identity story is inspired by the idea that honoring historic, the historic Albina community will be the guiding star for the success of the project. We use the reach of, and the, of the project to honor the vital past of this community, to remember their contributions and to build a better future with Albina as our North Star. So this is the North Star. And this is actually, we're calling this the heritage icon. I'm gonna move to the next page. This is exemplary of how this could be laid out. Might, might be a brochure cover, might be a report cover, but this icon in particular is actually a part of the, this is the heritage icon. And what it is, is it's based on the Hill Block building. So if you look at the building, this is supposed to resemble the architecture of the Hill Block building, the, the, the cupola, and even maybe some of the windows. So. This is the Albina North Star with a cultural piece that we're the Hill Block, Hill Block building. And this is it in a banner. And you can see that this, is, this can actually grow to be a semicircle and larger and it can move around. So this is our option one, Albina North Star. For our second direction, Future generations, we're initiating something totally new. Seeing things that we overlooked before, we're including the people going forward so that everybody gets it moving forward. So this is another take on the Albina North Star, but we're calling this one Albina Rising. So it's symbolic, it's, connect, it's a connection to the West African heritage by using the Adinkra sim, sing, symbols the literal meaning of these symbols, I don't know if you can see, but this is justice. This is the Sankofa revival and remembrance. And this is abundance. So the story here is that this is the connection and revival of, of Albina will inspire the identity. 
the Adinkra symbols represent the albina star rising out of this project. The individual characteristics of Sankofa, which is revival and remembrance, abundance and justice is a call on the community to fulfill these aspirations. Together, Albina Rising, the community, Albina Rising is the community rising to reach our greater potential. And this is, this is one layout with abundance. And then this is also what a brochure could look like with using, here's the symbol for justice, here's abundance, and here's Sankofa. So this one you can think of as a kit of parts. And then I'll move on. And then this is a banner with abundance. And then I'll move, this is the last one. See ourselves in the place we live. So this one we're calling Bloom. This is the blossoming, this is symbolic of the blossoming of a revitalized albina. So the bloom symbolizes the blossoming of a revitalized historic albina to inspire community connectivity and outcomes with the I-5 Rose Quarter Improvement Project. So you can see there's two directions here. There's the, the red bloom, and these are the symbols. This is the symbol of abundance. And then there's the, the black flower, flower bloom. And then here's another application. And then here's another application. So can we talk about these, Erica, or what, what would you like to, how do we- Indeed. Uh, uh, what I'd love to do, Jessica, thank you so much for all of your um, just commitment to trying to infuse the, the values into this branding process. I can uh, feel and hear your heart in this. Uh, so I appreciate all of your efforts, you and Albert, in, in um, taking all of that feedback uh, into this design. I want to give the opportunity for um, historic Albina Advisory Board members uh, who are on the call with us tonight to um, give their um, um, maybe their 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 top choice in regards to direction to be able to follow. So I want to preface with um, uh, we have several members um, who have uh, illnesses and and um, other issues that cause them to miss tonight. But I would like mm -hmm. to um, move forward if we can with those who are in the room to help us identify um, the branding that most I, most relates to them, uh, to the project values and moving this forward. Um, I'll let uh, Mr. Clark give me just one moment. So I will ask you all um, to give me um, your thoughts, one or two, uh, the North Star, am I correct? And the That's other correct. option is Bloom. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. And keep in mind that if we need to have further conversation in regards to one of the designs, there might be opportunity to do that, but we want to have a direction uh, for Jessica and her team to be able to move forward with. So I'll start uh, with your question, Mr. Clark. Um, well, it's more like um, more of a comment. I, I, I really like the direction of Bloom rather than the North Star. Um, the North Star, um, the meaning and the words and everything that you're saying are great, but I feel like it's too busy. I think that the everything will just get, it'll get lost, you know? Mm -hmm. So when I look at a brand and a mark and how you can use it multiple ways, you can see the simplicity more so in Bloom. And I think we can, you know, dive deeper into that later, but I think that's the direction that I'm going in. Beautiful. I appreciate that. Thank you. One vote for Bloom. I'm going to go next to Andrew Campbell. Oh, hey. Um, yeah, I agree what Mr. Clark mentioned about the, um, the Bloom image. It is more a little appealing. It's not as busy. And then also it... Um, me, yeah, it, 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 it's a good visual. 
um, especially, uh, you know, with the more of the Afro and things upon that. It's kind of like a more of a, yeah, it just connects with just the black culture a little more, but I do like the North Star and the connection of the uh, Tinker's symbols though, so. Um, if you yeah, had to decide, uh, would you lean more towards North Star or Bloom? Bloom. Perfect, thank you. I'd like to move on. I believe Mr. Washington is still with us. Yeah, um, I think the bloom is nice. I think that you should add some color to that whiteness that's in it, you know, because um, I, I know some sisters probably sitting here thinking about what they're thinking about. I, you know, I, I'm sorry, I did some beacon, <laughs> you know, but, but you might want to shade that put a little shade of some kind of color in there. You know what I say? <laughs> Respect, no problem. I enjoy that part of it. I appreciate you adding the mail to that to that flower too, because it sort of added that dimension when we were discussing it the last time, so, so yeah. Perfect, thank you, Mr. Washington. Pastor Richard Probasco? The bloom, the bloom was red. That, bloom. That, that it's, it's, it makes a statement it's easy to identify with as far as that's concerned. It has some excitement to it. I think the red just sets it off, captures attention. That's what we want. Thank you. Miss Leslie Goodlow, are you still with us? Yes, I'm still here. And I, um, I'm working still, so I didn't get a chance to see the second um, uh, visuals. So I, I can't give an, an answer at this point. So um, it, it sounded good from what I could hear, but I, I wasn't able to, to see them. No worries. I'm going to have Miss Jessica put it back up. You can take a quick look and I'll shift to Mr. Uh, Carlos Richard. <laughs> Dr. Richard. Hey, really? That's what you, how you right now? So, so this is Bloom. I'll let her take it in for a while. Dr. Richard, are you still with us? I don't get okay, a response. I'll go back to North Star. This is North Star. with the cultural heritage star. And this is Albina rising with the Adinkra symbols. And this was a kit of parts and it would only be one symbol at a time with the, with the brand or with, I'm sorry, with the, the name. Okay, so I liked the, uh in the North Star, like the um, reference to the hill block. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think that that's an appropriate reference. Um, I do like the red on the other one. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I am torn. Um, I don't know, maybe if you could change the color scheme in this first one, that that might make it different. It might make it pop a little bit more other than that blue. Um, but uh, so that that's my thoughts. I, I, I Looking at it on my phone, I'm not on my computer. So it's, I'm trying to make it large enough that I can read it or see it. Makes sense. Thank you so much for weighing in. I wanna make sure that, um, if Dr. Richard is still with us, um, that I get his way in. Hearing nothing. Um, based on what I've heard today, Jessica, I think um, the group would like to move forward uh, with further developing the, the Bloom logo. Um, and that's the direction um, that we should head in. Um, I wonder, um, if we can um, connect post 
Uh, and yeah. if there is further interest uh, in others adding, uh, as Mr. Washington's comments, uh, to, to, to highlighting some other areas in, in the branding, that there's an opportunity to do so. We'd love to do that, Erica. Um, however it works for the, the board members and yourself, we'd love to connect, yes. But so we should head towards Bloom, you think? That is what I'm hearing from this group based on all the responses we received. So yes, thank you, Jessica, Albert, thank you for your work. Thank you for being responsive. I know this has been um, a quick but tedious process uh, involved all of your interviewing, um, all of your time spent getting to know the people of Albina. So I appreciate all the work that you've put into it. <laughs> Miss Natalie, if you could share the slides for me. Absolutely, and apologies for the, the interruption there. No worries. I understand some of us are having some uh, connection issues, uh, but most of us should be used to that after a year of this COVID reality. So no apology necessary. Thank you very much. Um, here's where I was um, when I got kicked out. <laughs> Do we need no to advance worries. this way? Yes, please advance. We are well past. <laughs> Oh, well past this. Yes, ma'am. Perfect, here we are. Um, this has been a, a, a long evening. We've had some great conversation um, and I want to give uh, members of the community as well as the historic advisory, uh, the historic Albina Advisory Board, a brief synopsis of where we're moving forward. Um, please continue to keep in your mind the independent cover assessment work. Um, those online open houses will be beginning um, in the next week and we need your help and making sure that members of the historic Albina uh, community, those uh, black and brown uh, Portland folks have an opportunity to let their voices be heard in regards to what is their vision uh, for uh, what could happen uh, in this process. Um, we will be working with Jessica and her team to uh, finalize the project branding and uh, we will take a look again with um, Steve, uh, Drahoda, James and his team. They'll be bringing to you some more information in regards to the local streets. Um, we'll have some updates in regards to early work packages and a presentation on what performance measures would look like in regards to the outcomes of the project values. So we want to update you our next meeting together. Um, next slide, Miss Natalie. Um, yeah, those are great dates. So again, I'll reiterate, Independent Cover Assessment Workshop um, is going to be April 15th and 17th, and the online open house, we will need your help to putting the word uh, out there into the community. Our next meeting together will be on April 20th. That's a slight change. It should be in your calendar invitation. Uh, and in that meeting, you will be having um, uh, a mini workshop from the independent cover assessment team uh, to take you through uh, the same thing that our community stakeholders uh, will be experiencing. Dr. Holt, I would love for you to uh, share a closing thought with us as we wrap up this evening's meeting. Absolutely, great work tonight. Quite a bit of material covered. And uh, I don't think I've mentioned this before, but it's worthwhile to go back and review the meeting. You can go back, catch it online, and um, fast forward, rewind, pause, um, because moments like this is kind of a fire hydrant where um, you're getting thoroughly wet, but who knows how much you're retaining, right? Uh, so you might want to go back and check it out. Also, you can always reach out to Erica, myself, or Megan. Um, and ask any questions and further the conversation. It is so important what we're doing and it is so significant. We've got the opportunity to participate in shifting generational impact. And we appreciate your effort and your energy as you're involved in this process. My closing thought would be this, just as the spring is upon us and life is beginning to blossom and people are heading back outside, it's a great opportunity for us to think about how we are blossoming in this space and bringing the best of ourselves to this place to make lasting difference. Thanks so much for your efforts, your energy, and your time. 
Have an excellent night. Stay safe, everybody. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye. Good night, all.